Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Rudensky. I am the Senior Director for Education here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I am pleased to welcome all of you to our second session of our three-part professional development, Reconstruction After the Holocaust. For our first session, Professor Avi Pott spoke about the Jewish displaced persons. Today, Professor John Q. Barrett will discuss the Nuremberg trials. Our final session on February 26th will feature Professor Nancy Sinkoff, who will speak about Jewish cultural reconstruction and the Jewish historian, Lucy Davidovich. I just wanted to say a few thoughts about what brought me to organizing today's lecture. The Holocaust and other crimes that were committed by the Nazis during World War II, if not unprecedented, went beyond, at least in scope, the atrocities that had been carried out before. After the war, there was a crying need that the perpetrators of these actions be brought to justice. Carrying out this desire raised many questions. Let me just share a few with you. First of all, were the atrocities carried out by the Nazis technically illegal? After all, let's suppose that by Nazi law, appropriating Jewish possess possessions and then murdering Jews and others was in fact legal. If so, did those who carried out the final solution commit a crime? If we say that the law, if we say that the law and uh, was invalid and that the murders murders did commit crimes, who should be prosecuting? The people who set the policy but did not necessarily kill, physically kill anyone, or the police auxiliaries who carried out the dirty work? Let me ask another question: Who has legal standing or justification to bring a case? Can one party bring a case on behalf of another? Can, can the allies bring a case against the Nazi leadership if they were not the directly aggrieved party? And who should serve as judges? How do we ensure that there is a fair trial, that justice is done, and that, that we have something more than a, than a show trial? Today, we are fortunate to have these questions and the history around them explored by Professor John Q. Barrett. I am grateful that Professor Barrett has taken time out of his busy schedule to join us. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. Professor Barrett is the Benj Benjamin N. Cordozo Professor of Law at St. John's University in New York City, where he teaches constitutional law, criminal procedure, and legal history. He's also the Elizabeth S. Lena Fellow and a board member of the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. Professor Barrett is a renowned teacher, writer, commentator, and lecturer on law and history topics in the, United in the United States and internationally. He is writing a biography of US Supreme Court Justice and Nuremberg Prosecutor Robert H. Jackson, uh, and it, it will include the first inside account of Jackson's service during World War II by appointment of, pr of President Truman as the chief prosecutor of the principal surviving Nazi leaders. Professor Barrett discovered, edited, and published Justice Jackson's previously unknown, now acclaimed memoir, That Man, an insider portrait of Franklin D. Roosevelt, which is both FDR biography and Jackson autobiography. Professor Jackson is also the author of numerous articles and chapters, including on Justice Jackson, the US Supreme Court, and Nuremberg. Professor, Professor Barrett's regular Jackson List emails, hundreds are archived at thejacksonlist.com, each reach well over 100,000 readers, including lawyers, judges, teachers, and students around the world. Professor Barrett serves on the Board of Trustees of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum and is a trustee emeritus of the Historical Society of the New York Courts. And we are very delighted that Professor Barrett is here to join us today. Our plan for today is as follows. Professor Barrett will speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, after which time we will invite questions from the teachers attending the program. We're, we will submit questions by the chat. Um, so please, uh, during the lecture, if you would please write down your questions, um, and then you can submit it to me by chat, or if you want to submit them uh, on the chat during the lecture, that's fine too. Um, but uh, that's, that's how we'll handle the questions. After the lecture today, we will send you a link on, to an online evaluation form. Please plan to spend a few minutes completing it. Your feedback is important to us and to our funders, and I appreciate your taking this task seriously. 
For those of you who are taking this series for CTLE credit, I hope to issue certificates uh, after the final session. So that's the final session will be February 26th. So after that, um, I hope that you have found this series uh, meaningful so far, and I hope that you will find it useful in your teaching. I'd like to take a moment to thank our funder, the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany, for funding the series. Um, Without further ado, um, I will like to hand over our virtual microphone to Professor Barrett. Let me just repeat that you should um, keep yourselves muted um, and um, uh, we will be submitting questions in the chat. And without further ado, Professor Barrett. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, good afternoon to each of you. Uh, I wish at some level we were in person, but uh, I understand how healthy this is and convenient this is and how it's still really quite a sacrifice by each of you to sort of take a chunk out of a pretty Sunday afternoon and, and do weighty work. Um, I wanna flag the Museum of Jewish Heritage as a really important institution. I've had the privilege of lecturing there a number of times and being part of teacher training programs like this. Uh, and they do it very well and they do it at the very high end. I also want to say a word about teachers, uh, you know, you, each of you, me too, all of us together. Um, I think what we do is extremely important. Uh, and I really sort of cover the spectrum of all types of teaching, but um, the most consequential weighty kinds of teaching, I think, are the things that allow people to better locate themselves and empower themselves and direct themselves. And that, I think, includes a fair amount of learning about history, uh, what came before me, where I came from, and important projects that I can plug into in different ways. And that, so that's what each of you do. Uh, Paul gave me a little bit of background on the kinds of teaching and the kinds of schools that you're all parts of. Uh, but I really just applaud you in general for what you're doing, and I wish you well. Um, think of me as a resource. This talk is a resource, uh, but I'm also an easy person to Google and email and follow up with. Uh, and so I encourage you to do that. I'm happy to hear from you and, um, you know, we can continue after this hour. Um, what I want to do is talk about this topic for about 40 minutes or so. Uh, the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. And I want to do that by um, locating you. Um, I'm going to try and get the screen share to work a little better. Okay, that's the screen I'm sharing. Um, by locating you in Nuremberg, um, this is an aerial view of courtroom 600 in the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg which at the time this was taken was not in Germany because there was no Germany. This was in the US occupation zone of the former Nazi Germany. Uh, and so just as a matter of point in time and geography, let's sort of locate where we were, where this was, what we're talking about with the Nuremberg trials. Nuremberg is in Southeastern Germany. It is a lovely city. Uh, it is today a rebuilt and kind of facsimile uh, medieval city, a walled center city, the Altstadt, uh, and then parkland, river, uh, et cetera, in the surrounding area. It's about 100 kilometers north of Munich. So just to sort of locate yourselves, uh, we're in southeastern Germany, uh, north of Munich, well south of Berlin, uh, Leipzig, et cetera. Um, a spot of significance in Nazi German historiography, Holocaust historiography, is of course the Dachau concentration camp, uh, which was the first of the Nazi concentration camps opened in the spring of 1933. And Dachau is on the north side of Munich. Uh, so Dachau is sort of on the road, if you will, from Munich. Uh, a spiritual home of the Nazis, to Nuremberg, also a spiritual home of the Nazis, and a site of post-war accountability. That's the geography. The phrase Nuremberg trials also, I think, needs a little unpacking right at the top. There were 13 Nuremberg trials 
in the immediate post-war period. The time period is 1945 through 1949. And these were trials of so-called arch criminals, not mundane street level, particular atrocity in particular location criminals. Um, those people were held accountable um, in various ways in locality venue specific proceedings. Above them were commanders, bosses, policymakers, decision makers, so-called arch criminals. Their crimes weren't just in Dachau or just in Leipzig or just in Berlin or just in this or that location in occupied Poland, et cetera. These were overarching criminals. And so what the Nuremberg trials were, was an effort by the allies to hold arch criminals accountable. And Nuremberg was the location where this happened. The first of the 13 trials turned out to be the one and only international trial. It was a four nation trial, the US, the USSR, the United Kingdom, in other words, the big three allied military powers that had won World War II, plus the newly reconstituted French Republic uh, as the fourth allied nation, of course, from the fall of 44 through the spring of 45, France was also part of that alliance. And then having won the war together, those allies began an accountability process. And the idea was to do it together. And they did it together through one trial, which then sort of gave way to the Cold War, the alliance kind of fractured. And so there was never a second international Nuremberg trial. There were 12 additional Nuremberg trials, but those were US only trials. Uh, because once this allied project fractured, Germany, the former Germany was occupied in quadrants and Nuremberg was in the American sector of occupation. So in a sort of weird way, Nuremberg in this time period, 1945, 1949, was under U.S. Army occupation. It was in U.S. military occupation. So one international trial followed by 12 American-only trials. And we'll come back to the subject matter of what those covered. Um, so I want to proceed in uh, sort of segments. I'm going to stop screen sharing for now um, and see if this goes to full screen. Um, I don't know if that, Paul, is that full screen or am I still sharing? You're muted. You're, you're still sharing. Okay. I'm not quite sure how to turn that off. Uh, so if you don't mind the courtroom view, I'll stay in the little box. Um, but uh, it's not that important that you try and figure out each of the 400 people in the photo. Um, we'll just leave them there on the side. Um, so here are my eight topics that I will cycle through. Um, and the first few are going to be brief. Uh, I want to touch on the war. Uh, the war is the predicate historical event. Second, I want to talk about the plan, the allied plan to hold arch criminals accountable. Um, third, I want to flag the moment of victory and the power of victory and the sort of sweet spot that the spring of 1945 through into 1946 was. Um, fourth, I want to talk about the particulars of how this allied project kind of got organized, defined, and off the ground, how it got to Nuremberg, if you will. Um, fifth, I want to talk about the international trial the one international trial at Nuremberg, which was 1945 through 1946. Sixth, I wanna talk about the 12 subsequent American only Nuremberg trials. Seventh, I wanna to touch on some of the legacies of these proceedings. And eighth, I wanna talk about some of the limitations of these proceedings. So that's my outline, uh, that's the game plan. And really on each of those topics, I'm gonna to scratch the surface. So put your questions in the chat and you know, follow up with me or um, dive into deeper studies because this is only an introductory uh, exposure. So first, the war. Um, some of you are history teachers, uh, US history or global history teachers. Uh, the time period of World War II, depending on what your starting date is, is 1939 through 1945, the sort of hot war beginning with the invasion of Poland in September of 1939, 
until the Japanese surrender in August or earlier the Nazi surrender in May of 1945. Uh, it may be that earlier starting dates, uh, the Nazis coming to power in Germany in 1933, or the Nazis pressuring and uh, uh, obtaining capitulations from Austria, uh, the Munich Agreement, etc., are starting dates. But the the hot war, the horrible military uh, aggressive war, is Nazi Germany attacking, invading Poland beginning in September of 1939. And that war, of course, sweeps east, uh, and there's an alliance with the USSR, and Poland is largely divided up between the Nazis and the Russians. Uh, and the war in 1940 sweeps north and west. So this is the invasion of the Low Countries. This is the fall of the Low Countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, and it's the pivot across the Maginot Line. It's the invasion, the attack, uh, and the defeat of France by June of 1940. And in the summer of 1940, it's really England alone against Nazi Germany having conquered the European landmass. Um, I'd want to flag sort of uh, for full understanding of participation, uh, the Italian fascist government, which is also an ally of the Nazis and is also a sort of fighting conquering force in North Africa. Um, that's part of what England is alone against. The United States, on the other side of our vast Atlantic Ocean buffer, um, is not in this fight. And we are an isolationist country. We are a depression beset and really just emerging uh, economy. Uh, we're not interested in embroiling ourselves in a world war. We did that in 1917 and 1918. And this is you know, still a recent memory in 1940. Uh, what was that great war for? Why was so much American blood shed? What did it really change in Europe? Uh, and so American isolationism is a huge force um, that sort of puts on blinders and restrains action. Um, it's really Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor followed by Hitler's declaration of war on the United States in December of 1941 that changes that. We had begun to provide hardware assistance to Great Britain, but it wasn't our war until 1941. And then building up and mobilizing, uh, deploying, deciding how much would go west into the Pacific theater, how much would go east into the European theater, uh, the early landings in North Africa made it a war that we were now in, but we were far from winning. Uh, in 1941, we're just attacked. In 1942, we're just embarking on involvement. In the summer and fall of 1942, we're suffering, you know, really quite serious setbacks, and it's not at all clear who's going to win. Um, by 1943, that is changing as a matter of Hitler breaching his alliance with the USSR and sort of putting the USSR in the Allied column and the mobilization of population and economic might, uh, it becomes in 1943 a matter of time before Nazi Germany will be defeated. A huge and horrific matter of time, uh, but planning for a post-war, post-victory accountability process really begins among the allies, the UK, the US, the USSR in earnest in 1943. And this concept of crime, that aggression, that starting the war is a crime, an international crime, is a shared belief and commitment by the Allied powers. Um, there's no ambiguity about who started it, that the war we're in is a defensive war, is a responsive war, is a defeat of the aggressor war. And the idea that the aggression itself is a crime, a crime against the international order, is the shared allied view. It's a view that really grew out of World War I and the treaty commitments that were made following the Kaiser's surrender in 1918 in Versailles. Uh, and it's embodied in lots of bilateral treaties. And it's embodied in the 1928 Kellogg-Briand Pact, which unifies dozens of countries who say, we've suffered this war, we've paid this enormous price. What was it for? 
we won't do this again. We forswear war as an instrument of national policy. And so now the Nazis have done it again. What they've done is breach that new clear universal red line of war being illegal as a matter of international law. And the planning is to defeat these perpetrators, to capture these perpetrators, and then in some shared project to hold them accountable. It's not spelled out in the Moscow Declaration of 1943 or even developed in the later meetings, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt, even Yalta in February of 1945 is not really developing the plan in much detail. But the idea is that we will win this war and then we will together hold accountable the perpetrators who threw the world into this war is the plan. Um, the victory of spring 1945 uh, is the moment of universal shared power. Um, it's someone's quip, which I've adopted, that there was, there was a world war and the world won. Uh, because Nazi Germany, at least in the European theater, is standing alone. Italy has been defeated. Uh, Mussolini has been killed. The democratic government has succeeded. Uh, and, you know, the converging forces are now conquering Nazi Germany. And they share this victim fighting back, succeeding, winning and consensus of holding the perpetrators accountable and preventing a third world war as their shared project. Um, so that is the sort of the sweet spot. And if you think of that World War II culmination moment, there's a lot of things on a list that show you how unified the world was. Um, the creation of the United Nations is concurrent with the defeat, the surrender of Nazi Germany in the spring of 1945. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights that grows out of that, the constituting of the UN General Assembly, the Geneva Conventions and the Genocide Conventions later in the 1940s, and the Nuremberg Trial are all parts of a universal consensus moment. And frankly, when everybody's on board with the same project, we all know in our, our local lives and our committee work, uh, it's much easier to get stuff done than when views are discordant and power is limited and um, systems are fractured. So 1945 was a sweet spot. Um, and we shouldn't forget that as we study Nuremberg and get nostalgic about doing Nuremberg again, uh, it requires that kind of power and consensus. So let me turn to the project, actually how they got to Nuremberg and what it was. Um, each nation had to sort of step up to staff this commitment. And the United States went first. Um, Franklin Roosevelt had died on April 12, 1945. Harry Truman had inherited the presidency and inher had inherited this imminent victory in Europe. And it had inherited this allied commitment to hold the Nazi perpetrators accountable. Um, and frankly, what Truman needs is somebody to delegate it to. And so he reaches to the US Supreme Court for the person who I'm a biographer of, Robert H. Jackson, who had been a former attorney general of the United States, a Supreme Court justice for four years, a very accomplished litigator in both private practice and federal service, both trials and appeals, both civil and criminal. He was kind of America's leading law figure. And Truman thought highly of him. They'd had dealings when Truman was in the Senate and Jackson was attorney general of the United States. So Truman needs to sort of hire a lawyer. He asked Jackson to take on this job. It's late April 1945. And really, uh, it turns out to be a bill of goods. But the ask to Jackson is, will you prosecute Adolf Hitler? We're about to capture him. We're about to defeat Nazi Germany. Hitler and his inner circle of henchmen uh, will be our prisoners. And we've got a plan worked out with our allies that we will do it together. We've been gathering evidence. It's all set to go, but what we really need is for it to be staffed at a high, excellent level across the alliance. So if you are the American face, the Soviets will contribute a comparable, excellent Soviet face. The British will contribute a comparably excellent British face, uh, and we will do this all. Plus, you as a Supreme Court justice, you and school children are the two populations. You have a summer recess. So it's April, 
your court work is just about done for the term. This is all ready to go. It's almost a turnkey operation. You might be a little late in getting back to the court in the fall of 1945, but it's really a, a summer job. Will you prosecute Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, Goering, Bormann? Probably that was the inner circle uh, that they had in mind. When your president asks or when your country asks, I think it's, it's always right to say, yes, I will serve. Yes, I will help. Uh, plus, it's a kind of appealing job offer to any lawyer. Will you prosecute Hitler? Yeah. Um, plus, Jackson wasn't completely thrilled with life on the Supreme Court. And maybe this was a bit of a trial separation uh, from a kind of combative situation at the court. In any case, he signs on. And it's a private Truman recruit Jackson acceptance in the spring of 1945. And within a week, it all kind of turns to smoke. Hitler commits suicide. Goebbels commits suicide. Uh, Himmler commits suicide. Bormann is missing. There really is no worked out allied plan about how to do this. There really is no gathered body of evidence. There, by the way, isn't a courthouse or a place or an institution in which to have such a trial. And now Jackson's holding the hot potato. What he does is a quick survey trip to Europe in May of 1945 to ascertain all of this, comes back and finishes Supreme Court work in early June, and then relocates to London. And so before the Nuremberg phase, there is a summer 1945 in London diplomatic phase where they thrash this all out uh, and figure out how they're gonna do this together. The British do put serious talent at the table. The Russians do put serious talent. The French do put serious talent. It's a four-sided table with four different legal systems and four more or less differing conceptions of what a fair trial process will be. It pretty quickly shakes out that the U.S. and the U.K. are like-minded, Anglo-American law, you know, we're close cousins, and that the French are the weak fourth and not a particularly significant player in these negotiations, but that the Soviets have a very different view of what this is going to be. The Soviets are there to have an accountability process for the arch criminals. In other words, we've agreed going back to 43 and 44 and 45 that these aggressors are arch criminals. So yes, let's have a trial. Let's display that to the world before we kill them. In other words, a show trial. In other words, Verdict first, trial to follow. Jackson and the British supporting him say, wait a second, that's not due process. That's not the US constitutional system. That's not English common law. Um, a trial means a fair proceeding before an independent court, a burden of proof on the prosecutors, providing evidence and the ability to defend themselves to the defendants, a fair possibility of acquittal and doing this all in public. And so there's a lot of back and forth. And Jackson basically goes to Truman and says, the Russians want a show trial. I don't want to be part of a show trial. I'm working for you. What should I do? And Truman says, oh, just do what you think is right, which is really quite an extraordinary kind of delegation. And what Jackson thinks is right is what we all think is right, the constitutional legal traditions in which we Americans have grown up. And for whatever reasons, the Russians decide to give up on their model and to do it our way. And so the end of the process of negotiation in London in the summer of 1945 is an agreement on August 8, 1945, the London Agreement, which creates the world's first international criminal court. It's called the International Military Tribunal because military occupation is the situation in what had been Germany. And this is a four nation court, which will have jurisdiction over Nazi war criminals. It will have jurisdiction over four particular crimes, the crime of aggression, the supreme crime of starting the war, the crime of the crimes of war crimes, the sort of soldier on soldier battlefield crimes, which are in violation of the Hague conventions and international law that had been worked out in treaties jurisdiction over a new category, crimes against humanity, which are sort of occupier against occupied civilian populations, human rights crimes, atrocity crimes, 
what we will come to think of as Holocaust crimes. And as a sort of wrapper around those three substantive crimes, common planning or conspiracy, the sort of cabal that agrees to do these crimes. And this tribunal will have fair procedures. It will give every defendant the right to a written indictment showing him what the charges are. It will give him the right to choose his counsel who will be paid for, by the way, by the allies. It will give him 30 days to prepare himself to defend before the trial starts. It will give him liberal discovery of both documents and witnesses. It will give him compulsory process to call in, in effect, to subpoena defense witnesses. It will do this all in public. It will have a tribunal that is liberal in admitting evidence. And it will be a tribunal that doesn't work for the prosecutors and that holds the prosecutors to the American standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the London Agreement. That's the Charter of the International Military Tribunal. That's the plan heading from London across the channel. They pick Nuremberg because the US Army recommends it as the location. It's in the American sector. It can be secured by the American army. It can be provisioned by the American army. It has a standing courthouse with an adjacent prison complex that can accommodate all of this uh, adjudication activity. And by the way, it has a kind of optical salience that's a nice extra. The Nazis had had a spiritual centering in Nuremberg, um, part of their conceit of the Third Reich was that they were the successors of Bismarck, the Second Reich, and that they were the successors of the Holy Roman Emperor, the First Reich, and Nuremberg was a castle city of the Holy Roman Emperor, going back to the year 1000. And so the Nuremberg party rallies, the promulgation of Nuremberg anti-Semitic laws in 1935, um, these were part of the Nazis sort of wrapping themselves in Nuremberg as their location. And now the Americans say, well, you know, we can have this process in the place that once was theirs, and now it's kind of a, a comeuppance and an irony and a, a sort of nice book ending to do this in Nuremberg. And then they relocate to Nuremberg and they begin the process. They draft and file an indictment with this court, which each nation has appointed its judges to, that charges 24 individuals plus six Nazi organizations with one or more of those four crimes, with the waging of aggressive war, with the commission of war crimes, with the commission of crimes against humanity, and or with the engaging in a conspiracy to perpetrate those crimes. The indictment is a very long document that catalogs a lot of specifics. And that is served on the defendants, who are captured surviving Nazis, who are brought to Nuremberg, who largely represent the different sectors of Nazi perpetration. So you've got Hitler's number two, Hermann Goering. You've got Rudolf Hess, who had once been Hitler's number three. Um, that's the sort of center of Nazi power, both party and government. You've got Ribbentrop, the foreign minister. You've got General Keitel, the head of the German army. You've got Admiral Rader and Admiral Dernitz, the head of the German Navy. You've got Helmar Schacht, the economic minister. You've got Albert Speer, the minister of war production. You've got Julius Streicher, the anti-Semitic propagandist publisher of Der Sturmer. Uh, you've got Fritz Saukel, who's the head of the slave labor program out of the concentration camps. Uh, you've got Hans Fritsche, who is uh, a head propagandist under Joseph Goebbels. Uh, it's the sort of sector leaders. That's what arch criminals mean. These are the different pillars or the different functions of the Nazis and why they were able to do all that they did for horror, first in Germany and then as military aggressors. And these are the people charged at Nuremberg. They each choose a lawyer. Many of their lawyers are kind of unrepentant Nazis as many of these defendants were. Uh, and those lawyers are given documents, they're given housing, they're given food, they're given staffing, and it's a 30-day process before the trial begins. The trial starts on November 20, 1945, and runs into September of 1946. 
So it's approximately a nine month trial. Robert Jackson is the US chief prosecutor. Uh, he gives his opening statement on the second day, November 21, one of the most uh, eloquent and powerful courtroom speeches, or some would say speeches in the English language period in history. And it sort of outlines what the evidence will show. And what the evidence will show, Jackson says, is the common plan to accumulate military power in Germany, to break out of the restrictions of the Treaty of Versailles, to build up an army, to build up a navy, to build up an armed force, and then to expand by conquering neighbors, the ones that capitulated, and then the ones that needed to be invaded and defeated militarily. And the ethic or the purpose of all of this was Aryan philosophy, Nazi racialism, uh, superiority, anti-Semitism, um, unfit eaters, uh, all the horrors of what we will later put the word Holocaust on. Uh, and then the case goes forward and it's prosecuted in the traditional American sequence. Prosecutors go first. And so the case against each of the 24 individuals and the cases against the charged organizations and a division of responsibilities across the Americans and the British and the Russians and the French. And then each defendant having a chance to take the stand and testify if he wished, to call witnesses in his own defense if he wished, to introduce documents, affidavits, etc. It's a very paper intensive, document intensive trial. A design choice that Jackson made was to uh, basically try the case more on Nazi documents that couldn't be contested rather than to cut plea bargains with cooperators who would point the finger at each other. Um, you get into swearing contests about whether this rat is telling the truth about this person who they are testifying against. This trial largely avoided all of that stuff because the captured documents were so powerful, uh, authentic, uncontested. Um, this trial, in the end, um, going in is a war trial. It's aimed at aggression as a supreme crime. And over the course of the trial, what the evidence gives to the prosecutors, the courtroom, and through them to the world is a dawning early evidentiary understanding of the Holocaust. So a way to think about Nuremberg is the trial starts as a war trial and comes out or concludes as a Holocaust trial. What they discover in the course of the trial through documents and through witnesses is not just concentration camps in Germany, which were political prisoners and enemies of the Reich and became horrible killing places, but designed extermination camps in the East, um, Auschwitz, Sobibor, Treblinka, which were not surviving facilities and not well understood at the end of the war at the start of the Nuremberg trial, but became something that we understood better and wrapped our minds around the horror of during that trial process. That becomes the evidentiary record, the documentary record of everything that we have going forward that's Holocaust study. My next phase briefly is to touch on the 12 subsequent trials. After the judgments of the international trial, 18 guilty, three not guilty of the individuals and three others had dropped out or died along the way. Um, and of the 18 guilty, 11 sentenced to death and seven sentenced to terms of years. And of the six organizations, three found guilty and three found not guilty. This alliance fractures. The US, the USSR, the start of the Cold War, overtakes the desire to continue to work on this together. And so the other allies have their sectors and they have accountability processes ranging from a lot of show trials in the Soviet sector to quite real trials in the British and French sector. And in this sector, the American sector, the 12 subsequent Nuremberg trials. If the first trial is really the pinnacle of the pyramid and the arch criminals of arch criminals, think of these next trials as deeper digs into those sectors and particular aspects of those sectors. So they are, for example, the Nazi doctor's trial involving gruesome medical experimentation. 
They are the Nazi lawyers and prosecutors trial, which involves the perversion of legal forms to be rigged proceedings. That is the trial that's actually portrayed in the film Judgment at Nuremberg. Judgment at Nuremberg is not about the, the first international trial. It's about the American trial of the lawyers and judges. It's a case focused on the industrialists that had used slave labor to do military production um, and keep the German army uh, in steel and in the field deep into 1945. Uh, and I will show you a list of these other trials. Those 12 subsequent trials run into the spring of 1949, and then even the United States has sort of run out of gas on this. Uh, and so wrap it up and come on home and conclude Nuremberg is really where we are before 1950. Um, that's less than 300 defendants all told across 13 trials. Um, it is a documentary record, but it's far from perfect accountability. So where does that leave us in terms of legacies? I wanna flag three. The first is Holocaust knowledge. As I've already said, this dawning horrific realization is in this courtroom during 1945, 46, and continues in this courtroom, 46, 47, 48, into 49. And that's the understanding and the evidentiary record that allows Israel to pursue Eichmann and bring him to Jerusalem and try him there in 1961, and is the basis for Holocaust historiography, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, the US Memorial, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, Yad Vashem, Holocaust education, all of that needed Nuremberg in a sense. If they had not done the laborious evidentiary process of Nuremberg, but instead had just taken their Nazi prisoners and finished them off, lined them up against the wall, of course there would have been all the survivors and all the horrific things that they could describe as individual experiences. But there would have been no aggregation of them, no focus on them, no media attention to them, no validation of them by a judicial determination, and no sort of institutional imprimatur of the United Nations on this really having, ha having happened as an individual in an, uh, this or that experience would describe. Um, Nuremberg puts it all together and allows everything that goes forward. A second legacy is some of the principles that emerges from the Nuremberg trials. And these are actually sort of drafted into a document by a United Nations Legal Commission in 1950. There are seven Nuremberg principles. Some of them are really quite familiar to you. Following orders as a military subordinate is no defense, um, you know, no following orders. That was a rule of the Nuremberg trial. Um, no command immunity. Being the head of state or being a general does not mean the rule of law does not reach up to you. Informed consent in medical treatment uh, is another of the Nuremberg principles, et cetera. I will show you a slide that touches on that. A third legacy is international law development. Um, there are serious questions, there were at the time, and there probably always will be, about the legal legitimacy of the Nuremberg trials, uh, because they created a court. There was no court. The question is, did they retroactively impose new law, or did, through the treaties and through the national laws and the moral commitments that long predated the Nazis, did they already have a law? But whatever the resolution of those questions, after Nuremberg, there is Nuremberg itself as a precedent. And it takes the Cold War 50 year period before that precedent is really useful. But in the 1990s, Yugoslavia atrocities leads the United Nations to create the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Rwanda atrocities leads to the creation of the Rwanda Tribunal. A diplomatic process ultimately produces a draft treaty and more than 60 nations sign on to the Rome Treaty by 2002 and that creates the International Criminal Court. And there are other kind of ad, ad hoc international law development projects. The most recent one is the newly extremely important, extremely difficult European Union and Ukrainian government joint effort headquartered at The Hague 
to gather evidence and prepare for accountability processes should events develop so that a Russian perpetrator of last year's aggression in Ukraine be in custody and able to be prosecuted. Um, so my eighth and last topic, very quickly, what are some limitations? Um, first, it takes peace. Uh, you cannot, in the fighting heat of a horrific war, hold the perpetrators accountable for what is happening, to start that or as it's being conducted. Uh, and so international justice is ideal and beautiful and sometimes successful, but it cannot occur very much during wartime. Second, it takes power. It takes uh, consensus. It takes the sort of unity of minds so that the power doesn't veto the project. Um, and there was no Nazi veto on Nuremberg. There is a Putin veto, if you will, on holding Putin accountable. And he's got China backing him up in the UN Security Council. Third limitation is you know, sort of obvious in the numbers and the statistics. Um, justice through a criminal process, through adjudication is always partial. It's always imperfect. It is on the big stage for these kind of events. It is at the local level. If you look at you know, any petty crime in your community or any significant crime, there are people getting away with murder. That's not a pun. Literally, there are people getting away with murder in every city in the country because crimes don't get solved or when they get solved, the perpetrator is dead or because the perpetrator is a fugitive and you get down to more less serious crimes, you know, that's the same description I would offer. Um, and that's true up at this level too. Uh, so those are some sort of general comments on the Nuremberg landscape. I wanna resume sharing and quickly scroll through these slides and then it'll open up to questions. This is Justice Robert Jackson in May of 1945, when Truman publicly announces his appointment as the US Chief Prosecutor. This is the two of them and a full ashtray on Truman's desk in the Oval Office. This is the map of the occupation zones in what had been Nazi Germany until it surrendered unconditionally in May of 1945. And generally there's a sort of uh, proximity principle here. So the pink Northeast quadrant, Northeast closest to the USSR is the Soviet zone. The yellow Northwest quadrant closest to the United Kingdom, give or take, is the British zone. The red, white, and blue stripes adjacent to France is the French occupation zone. The blue area is the ally not from the neighborhood. That's the American occupation zone. And I don't think I have a cursor, but basically right in the middle of that blue area is where Nuremberg is located. You see the big dot maybe of Munich and just a little bit north of there. The same on the lower right occupation division is what had been Austria because that was part of the Third Reich. This is a hard to see picture of the four-sided table in London. The negotiation, you see Robert Jackson on the right in the bow tie and you see the backs of the Soviets, uh, one turn smiling faces and interpreter, but this is the fighting it out of show trial or real trial, fair trial or rigged proceeding that is part of the summer of 1945. This is the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg and it shows you how along the main street, the front of the building is a courthouse and behind it, the wheel and spoke is the prison complex. Um, I will show you that there was some bomb damage, but it was largely intact. And so it's in the American sector of occupation. It's ours to secure. It's a facility that it can accommodate this in what the Nazis had regarded as their spiritual home. This is a glimpse of some of the roof damage, a stray bomb, uh, it could be repaired. This is the annex building and the four windows on what we would call the third floor is courtroom 600. You can see how they patch the roof. You can see all the US Army Jeeps and soldiers that are part of securing this. That's the site of the international trial and the 12 subsequent proceedings. This is the signing of the London Agreement on August 8, 1945. This is back to the aerial view of the courtroom. And now you see the layout on the far right, two rows are defendants in the dock. 
in front of them, two rows are defense attorneys. Across from them are assistants to the judges in those two rows. And the high bench, I'll give you a better view, is the judges. In front of us is the podium from which the prosecutor uh, or defense attorney will be speaking. And behind them are the five tables occupied by the prosecutors. Closest to the door on the right is the French table. Toward the center, the next table in, a man in uniform you see on the corner is the Soviet table. In the center is the American table. To the left of that is the British table. And the farthest to the left is an overflow table. We are in the air above the defendant's stand from which people testified. So you see the podium of the questioner and that's where the defendants sat. These are the judges. Each nation appointed a principal judge and an alternate. In the end, no principal had to withdraw, got ill, et cetera. And so it functioned as really a court of eight. They were all present. They were all very hardworking. They were all um, active questioners and they all deliberated together and rendered the judgment, even though that really wasn't quite what the London Agreement had specified. You notice in this distant view, but here you see it close up on the judges, everyone is wearing headphones. This was like Paul Rudensky, uh, but this was the world's first simultaneous translation judicial proceeding. Uh, there was in the front corner of the courtroom, a box containing interpreters, each of whom was able to do a pair of languages. And so whatever the speaker was speaking, German, English, French, uh, or Russian, there was an interpreter who could interpret it into each of the other three languages. So if you're an English speaker and somebody's speaking Russian, somebody is doing interpretation from Russian into English. And at your seat, there was a hook with the headphones and a dial so that you could choose to listen to what you prefer. Live proceedings, English, Russian, French, German. And so it allowed everyone to be simultaneously in the conversation. Um, these were technologies that they had taken from the League of Nations, which had then loaned them to the San Francisco conference containing that created the United Nations. And it functioned pretty well, not perfectly, and it required everybody to be a little slower than I'm speaking right now, but it allowed everybody to largely be in real time in a language they understood. These are the defendants in the box. Um, the far left front row corner is Hermann Goering. Next to him is Rudolf Hess. Next to him is Ribbentrop, Keitel. Uh, this is Albert Speer in the back row. This is Julia Stryker, the propagandist. Um, they were, as I said, sector leading perpetrator figures. This is Jackson at the podium, as I said, opening the trial on November 21, 1945. This is an incredibly important witness midway through the trial. This is Rudolf Hurst, not to be confused with Hess here, second from the left in the defendant's box. This is Rudolf Hurst, H O E S S, who was the commandant of Auschwitz. He was missing until he was located, and then they notified the defenses that he was alive and captured, and people wanted him brought to Nuremberg. And what he did was testified what he had done running Auschwitz. He, in fact, kind of exaggerated his numbers, but he said at Auschwitz, they exterminated over 2 million Jews, plus disease had killed almost 800,000 more, give or take 3 million killed in Auschwitz. Um, and that is something that he said he did because the Fuhrer ordered it. Hitler to Himmler to Eichmann to Hearst was the chain of command that directed him to do his part to exterminate all the Jews in this occupied area of the general government in Poland. This is April 1946. This is for the world really the first moment where those numbers and that horror of design is unambiguously claimed as a job performed by the bureaucrat who did it. You see on the chart, the map on the wall behind him, all of those red dots indicate concentration camps, extermination camps, or slave labor um, adjacent facilities. 
That's the Holocaust evidence emerging in the course of this trial. This is one of the 42 bound volumes of the trial transcripts. Plus, there are 10 volumes of official authenticated documents. Plus, there are 12 other volumes on the American only trials. The Nuremberg trial produced a lot of paper and a lot of unambiguous record for our understanding of the Holocaust. A website I want to flag here, which contains all of it, is a Yale University. It's called the Avalon Project, and it's historical documents by century. So go Avalon, Yale, 20th century, Nuremberg trial, and then you will find an incredibly comprehensive battery of resources. This is Jackson with one of his principal deputies, Telford Taylor. And after the first international trial, Jackson returned to the Supreme Court. And Telford Taylor was the US chief counsel for the 12 subsequent trials. These are, or somewhat obscured here, on two slides, the 12 subsequent trials. So you see the medical case or the doctor's trial. You see the trial of Field Marshal Milch. You see the judge's case. You see the Pole case, which is a hostage case. You see the Flick case, which is an industrialist case. You see Farben, which is an indu another industrialist case. You see the Einsatzgruppen case, which is the mobile killing teams that trailed Nazi infantry into the USSR before the Auschwitz and extermination camp architecture uh, was designed as a more efficient way to kill more people. You see Krupp, another industrialist case, the ministries, which is basically a cabinet case, and you see the military high command. That's what the 1946 through 1949 phase was. This is the United Nations General Assembly in its first uh, incarnation before we built the uh, 44th Street UN headquarters that you all know. And these are some of the Nuremberg principles that the UN General Assembly adopted drafted by its legal commission and extracted from the Nuremberg proceedings. Um, anybody who commits an international crime is liable to punishment. The fact that there's not a domestic law doesn't relieve you from international accountability. The fact that you're a head of state doesn't relieve you from accountability. The fact that you followed orders does not relieve you from accountability. This is a partial list, but if you just Google Nuremberg principles, you will see the international law whether it existed in such a clean form before Nuremberg that has existed ever since and informs and hopefully improves our behavior. This is the Yugoslavia Tribunal set up in The Hague in the Netherlands in the 1990s, um, an ad hoc tribunal which existed for 20 years. This is its most famous defendant, Slobodan Milosevic, who died during his trial. But the Yugoslavia Tribunal accomplished in that still very fraught multi-ethnic, multi-war context, a serious couple of decades of international accountability. This is the Rwanda Tribunal, which comparably did, this is in Arusha, Tanzania. It also had some proceedings in The Hague, did comparably successful work. This is the permanent headquarters in The Hague of the International Criminal Court, which is an ongoing um, and although hard, uh, somewhat successful now 20-year-old institution. Um, this is why it's hard. The nations in green are the participants in the international criminal court system. And the nations in pink and white are not part of the international criminal court system. And you notice generally as a matter of landmass, but also generally as a matter of superpower status, the US, the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, uh, et cetera, are not part of the ICC process. Um, now they can perhaps in time join, but in the meantime, this institution doesn't have jurisdiction because these people haven't signed up. And notice what this correlates with. This is a map showing the nuclear nations of the world. Generally, the non-participants in the ICC are the nuclear powers of the world. And that is why it takes peace, it takes power, it takes consensus, and it is an imperfect process um, to think about justice solving our problems. If the gangs really controlled New York, 
our district attorneys would be losing if the gangs or the perpetrators of international crimes uh, have impunity because they are not within the jurisdiction, because they have not made themselves within the jurisdiction of legal accountability on the global stage. What follows from that is the absence of an easy way to get those perpetrators in the dock. Nonetheless, we have made, I think, a significant amount of progress. We have made, um, of course, knowledge progress, our understanding of what the Nazis were and what the Nazis did and what the Holocaust was, and our development of the legal precedents and principles coming out of that, and our development of the institutions and the idea that decent preference for law over war and for accountability over impunity is progress, um, is something that is an accomplishment of the 20th century and continuing in ours. Um, and the only way to build on it is to keep teaching. So I do that and you do that and we're in it together. I, I don't think one should be naive or um, think that there's a success date ahead. We're not gonna win this Super Bowl um, anytime ever and certainly not anytime soon, but we inch it forward. Harry Truman did, Robert Jackson did, their counterparts did, the Yugoslavia and Rwanda and ICC prosecutors do. Every teacher, lawyer, value embracing person um, who kind of does their part moves this forward. So keep up the good work. I would thank, welcome your questions. Thank you very much, um, Professor Barrett. That was really a fantastic presentation and uh, in a fairly short period of time really covered a huge amount of material. So we're really grateful for you for for really introducing this to us. And uh, and also, I think, you know, showing that there's progress, that even if it's not perfect, there's still a lot of progress. So, um, you know, really, really very grateful for you for, for, for the presentation. We do have some comments that have come in. And as Professor Barrett said, please, uh, Feel free now to submit more. I'm just going to take a look at the um, uh, take take a look at the the, the chat right now. Yeah, um, and obviously I went a little longer than I was supposed to, and we're in overtime. If you have a next commitment, no hard feelings, and go right to it. Uh, but I'm happy to stick around. So here, so there's a number of questions. I'll I'll try to get through as many as I can. Um, uh, one question is, were there Soviet-only trials? Yes, lots, um, in, including before Nuremberg, because the Soviets had pushed Nazi Germany back to the West. Uh, so the Kharkiv trial in 1944, I believe, was really the first of captured German officers, uh, and they were finished off pretty quickly, um, you know, zero acquittal rate, uh, and also lots of captured German military and other personnel were brought to the East uh, and there were trials and frankly, people just went to the gulag and there was slave labor, uh, but there, there was a lot of, you know, sort of rough accountability in the Soviet sector. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, here's a question from uh, one of the teachers from Canada. He says that, um, we had a couple, a couple parts of the question here. Uh, sorry, let me, Okay, well, he wanted to get a copy of the lecture, but but we'll help post it on, on YouTube, so it should be available. Um, here we go. Uh, so the same teacher asked this question. If a country admits to genocide, are there any legal ramifications? He asked because, because the Prime Minister of Canada has openly stated that genocide, genocide was undertaken towards our First Nations peoples. Um, well, there are two la layers of accountability. There's, you know, sort of national accountability, which is political and legal. Um, you know, obviously the passage of time means individual victims of a nation's lawbreaking might no longer be with us by the time such an omission occurs. But, you know, intra-Canada or intra-any nation, there's that accountability process. Um, and that really is a priority. There's a concept called complementarity, uh, which is the way the ICC and every institution on the international stage works. They fill the gaps 
in a way that is complementary to national processes. So if national processes have dealt with something or in the process of dealing with something, the international um, alternative does not need to be deployed. Um, in a non-national response situation where evidence would indicate perpetration of genocide, uh, you know, a crime against humanity under international law, and a tribunal had jurisdiction and could obtain physical custody of a perpetrator, uh, international criminal prosecution is a, a sort of ultimate possibility. Um, and there were such prosecutions, for example, in the Rwanda tribunal. Thank you. Here's another question and touches a little bit on one of the previous questions that we had. Um, do you find the depiction of the trial by one of the Soviet uh, participants and eyewitnesses, um, uh, uh, I guess it's A.I. Polterok, J.D. Juris Doctor, I guess, accurate as depicted in his document-based books on the trial. So, so I guess there is the, a Russian book, and it looks like it's translated also into English, called the Nuremberg Epilogue, and it was popular in the Soviet Union. Yeah, I, I don't have... A detailed book review I, I have looked at, read, I mean, their translations, uh, some of that literature. Generally, Nuremberg is a historically celebrated achievement. It was under the USSR and is to this day in the Russian Federation. Uh, exactly who did what at Nuremberg is a bit of a proportional um, allocation question and who's telling the story affects who gives how much credit. Um, the Russian version of Nuremberg is that it was a Russian um, accountability process against the fascist perpetrators of the Great Patriotic War. Um, it's not very Holocaust specific. Um, it's not very Jew identifying as a witness, as a victim. The victims are commissars. And the aggression is mostly the aggression against the USSR, the motherland, uh, beginning after June of 1941 with sort of no description of the history or the Nazi-Soviet alliance that predated June of 1941. So um, much of what Polterak and other Russian scholars cover includes correct and important information, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily a full or proportionate account. Oh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, here's another question, and I think a, a lot of people will have this too. So when you 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 listed, um, you know, how many people were, uh, you know, charged as guilty, and then how many people were uh, executed, and the people were acquitted, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I I sort of touched that button and and hoped and knew people would come back to that. Um, of the 24 individuals who were charged in the October 1945 indictment, uh, one of them was found to be incompetent. Um, that was Gustav Krupp of Krupp Industries. So based on age and senility, we would call it, or Alzheimer's or dementia, um, he was severed. Uh, another defendant, Robert Lye, who was the head of the Nazi Labor Federation, committed suicide in the prison. Um, and so, you know, that's another one who's missing. Um, and uh, during the course of the trial, they had hoped to apprehend Martin Bormann, um, who they believed or they weren't certain was dead. They believed he was alive and was a fugitive. Um, they tried him in absentia, uh, but, you know, it turned out they never found Bormann. And it turns out decades later, his death was established. Um, so, you know, one more complication, and we're down to 20 in the box, uh, 20 actual individuals. And of those 20, um, the, you know, the convictions are 17 of them, Borman and absentia is the 18th conviction. Um, and most are convicted of most of the charges, but some are mixed verdicts. It took three out of the four nations to convict. Uh, and so, you know, the Russians dissent from the acquittals, but where two or more of the allies, other allied nations voted not guilty, that was not guilty on account. Three of the individuals were acquitted on every charge uh, and they were Helmar Schacht, 
the economic minister. Um, they were uh, Hans Fritsche, who was the propagandist, but sort of a, a small stand-in for Goebbels and not a great propagandist, frankly. Um, and Franz von Papen, who was an aged diplomat and very important in Hitler coming to power in 1933, but not very important in the war years and the conduct of what Nazi Germany did. Uh, and so those three people are released. Um, they are later prosecuted in German national denazification processes, but in the international tribunal, they are acquitted. So of the 18, 17 real people who are convicted, uh, 10 received death sentences. And two weeks later, those are carried out. Uh, Goering got a cyanide pill. So a few hours before he would have gone to the gallows, he committed suicide. The others are hanged in a gymnasium at Nuremberg. And then the people who were sentenced to terms of years were transported from Nuremberg up to the southeast of Berlin um, in the Soviet sector to the Spandau prison, and they served their sentences there. Uh, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and in one case, a life sentence. And that prison was really the trailing remnant of the four nation cooperation of this trial. It was actually administered by the four nations through all of those decades in three month rotations. So, you know, this quarter, the French would run Spandau prison, then the British would come in, then the Russians would come in, then the Americans would come in, and then the next year it would be the same cycle. And by the end, the only life sentence was Rudolf Hess, uh, who was a sole prisoner in Spandau uh, and into an old age and maybe in um, you know, not sound mind. Um, and he committed suicide there in the 1980s. Uh, and that was the end of these defendants and the service of those sentences. Uh, and then very quickly, Spandau Prison was plowed under, and there's no no trace of it today. Wow. No, thank you, thank you very much. We have time for one more question. Um, so um, let me let me roll this one out. But uh, this is a fascinating discussion. Um, so this question is: How do Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, the Hague tri Tribunal, compare to Nuremberg uh, in terms, I guess, in general, and in terms of defining what genocide is? Well, let me pick up the last part. Genocide was a word used in the Nuremberg indictment, the charges. It was not used in the Nuremberg judgment. And the coiner of the word, uh, Polish lawyer Raphael Lemkin, who was a consultant to Jackson and the American team and had sort of coined this word for this new horrific concept and got it into the indictment, was gravely frustrated that the judges had not included it in the judgment. And so Lemkin continued his campaign. He went to the United Nations and persuaded the UN General Assembly and a variety of nations to propose a genocide convention. That's by the end of 1946. And then over a two year process, it's ratified by enough nations to go into force. That's in 1948. So that builds on Nuremberg, but in significant ways, puts genocide in international law. Uh, the later tribunals, cr the ad hoc tribunals created by the United Nations, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, and then the ICC created by the participants in that treaty agreement, all have, in differing ways, explicit jurisdiction over that crime, among other crimes. And so they kind of take it forward from there. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I see that we are out of time. So, I, so uh, Professor Barrett, I'd like to thank you again for really a very stimulating and, and fascinating presentation. I'd like to thank all of our attendees today, the teachers and the museum gallery educators for joining us um, for today's lecture. Um, our final uh, lecture for this series will be on February 26th, so I'll be sending out uh, the link for that closer to the date. Uh, I want to wish everybody a great afternoon, um, and um, just think about how you can use this material uh, in your teaching or, you know, when you're, when you're uh, doing tours at the museum. Um, and I think, I think there's a lot to take from it. So again, thank you to all of you, and uh, looking forward to seeing you all, or most of you, on the 26th. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, everyone.